cosmopolitan tensions, sovereignty disputes, re re resolution, and how it all comes together. So for the next 15 okay. minutes or so, Oscar, do you want uh, me to help you with this? Very little less, we're all yours. Oscar has brought a presentation, oh, but I shall try to get going. Uh, this is. Uh, hey, no, that's Gabriel. Uh, you, that's Gabriel. Yeah. This is Oscar. Oscar, have fun. Okay, thank you. Well, I am very happy to be here today. Um, uh, I knew uh, Jorge from the Juris North opportunity he gave me the first time in Manchester. He opened the wall of the academic scholarship, the Anglo-Saxon academic scholarship. He gave me some advice. Uh, some months ago, we, he came to Madrid and we have a workshop in my university. It was a success. And now we are here. Well, I, make a, I made a review of this book in Spanish. If someone is interested, uh, write me an email and I send the, the review in Spanish. Um, um, okay, well, uh, well, I have to say that in, in my, uh, this is the summary of my, my review of this book of Jorge, title, and, uh, Cosmopolitanism, State Sovereignty, and International Law and Politics. Uh, the main characteristics of this book, or the, the new, uh, um, the new um, uh, approach of this book is based on multidimensionality of pluralism of pluralisms. And one of my, the, the first topic that I'm going to talk is based on this approach and the consequences of this uh, approach. Um, in, the, in the review, in the final part of the review, I explain some of the, of the main traits of this book that I think we have to focus. First in the, is the interdisciplinarity. This is not a book of international law. This is not a book of philosophy of law. This is not a book of political science. This is not a book of philosophy of law. It's a book of everything <laughs> at the same time. This is something very interesting. Very interesting because it achieved the goal to, to, to talk in these different, in these different languages. Uh, but there are some pro the, it's not a complete, there are, I think, some, some things to think about. Um, the second is the analytical method. Well, this is from the Anglo-Saxon part and from the Argentinian part. My, one of the main, um, some of my professors were Argentinian and some of the professors of Jorge were Argentinian. Uh, we, we have the same Argentinian analytical background they are Churon and Buligin and Garzón Valdez and some professors, we share some uh, these professors. And this analytical method that is not so Latin, the analytical method in the Anglo-Saxon world is that you, you can discuss a lot, but there is no, there is no emotive uh, content, no? If you, if you are a Latin and you dis disagree with someone, it seems that you are angry with someone, and this is, this is not the case. <laughs> uh, second is the vocation of applicability. <laughs> Uh, and I think this is a practical book. I, I make a question in Madrid. I made a question in Madrid. Uh, wh what is the practical point of this? Of this um, but I think this, this book has a practical idea. And it, this is a great research project. And in the new book, I think uh, you are going to apply this some practical, some practical questions. OK. Uh, well, I have a challenge. Uh, I have to talk about a lot of things, and I would like to summarize my points uh, in order to make a discussion, an interesting discussion. My first point is this view of pluralism of pluralism and interdisciplinarity. My first question is, what about territorial disputes and right to self-determination? There is uh, something to say about this. <coughs> Second is uh, related to universal law. How we can talk about universal law and uh, um, uh, stand for relativism? For me, this is a paradox. Uh, this is not clear. Second, uh, um, um, uh, 
eh, eh, Jorge Núñez eh, back a exclusive legal positivism approach and apply this approach uh, to his cosmopolitan positive law. And in order to discussion, this is a eternal discussion, I am going to disagree with this exclusive positive law and I'm going to disagree not from the interpretativist uh, Alexi Dorkinian approach that maybe I like it much, but from her, that it's a moderate approach. And um, <coughs> Okay. Well, self-determination, the right to self-determination is a complex principle. It's recognized uh, that as a legal principle uh, between others as state sovereignty, equality of states or equality of peoples within a state. And there is a definition of territorial disputes, a disagreement about who owns a territory, and the examples that uh, Jorge uh, gave in, in a previous book is Jerusalem, Kashmir, Gibraltar, Crimea, and the Falklands, Malvinas, Islands, but there are many more. Uh, well, uh, there are all the precise, more precise definitions of territorial disputes, and um, I find the definition of Anaya, James Anaya, that he is an expert on indigenous people. And I think it's interesting because usually self-determination is internal, external. But I think this is not proper um, interesting in order to approach the question of self-determination. And he proposed a definition between constitu constitutive and ongoing element of self-determination. De and uh, in international law, uh, According to Buchanan, uh, only it's uh, this right to succeed recognized to the classic decolonization, to an unjust military occupation or cases of oppression, and uh, with a racial group has been denied meaningful access to participation in government. This is the case of South Africa, no? The, the case of <coughs> apartheid, no? Uh, it's interesting because this is in the book of Buchanan, but Buchanan uh, gave reasons in favor and against secession. And it was interesting because when Buchanan came to Spain, gave an interview to a, to a Madrid newspaper and gave an interview to a, a Spanish newspaper, uh, to a Catalan newspaper, uh, to a Barcelona newspaper, and, and in one interview seems to be pro uh, <laughs> secession and in the other against secession. And we don't know Buchanan, where is Buchanan? <laughs> Uh, okay, also Rath has an idea of self-determination. And, okay, here's a point. Nunez. <laughs> uh, uh, characterization applying fundamental in the resolution of territorial disputes. And uh, I think Nunez in this case has a reasonable solution, a moderate solution, um, and says that self-determination is not in the form of cessation is not an advisable solution, and there are other remedies that can secure a permanent and peaceful understanding among all the involved agents. And in other words, um, it's a uh, ultimum remedium in, situ in situations um, um, in situations that there is no other pro uh, possible uh, solution. No? Well, I have found a Spanish international law professor of my university who says that in the case of Catalonia, there is no, is not a colony, they are not oppressed, it's not the case of South Africa, or they are not occupied, um, and maybe there is this not right to decide that in this case. Okay, what is important in the book? My point is, in pluralism, pluralism, and in multidimensionality, in territorial disputes. Territorial disputes is one thing, self-determination is another thing. But in multidimensionality, in pluralism of pluralism, there is any intersection between the, these two rights, or they are always completely different. Mm -hmm. That's my point, because it's not completely clear for me. Mm -hmm. And, and um, this is uh, my point. OK. Uh, my second idea, or my second question is that, okay, Núñez uh, 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 stand or back uh, the view of Kelsen about absolutism and relativism, 
and he's in favor of democracy and relativism. And um, Kelsen established a robust connection between relativism and democracy. And uh, this uh, in metaethical, uh, metaethics uh, is linked with uh, non-cognitivism. Uh, this means the motivism of prescriptivism. This means that when we talk about ethics, we express the speaker feelings or attitudes. <coughs> there is no, no propositions at all. Um, and I find in the paper different paragraphs of Kelsey in which we can identify when is non monotheism or uh, relativist in the weak sense. Relativist in the weak sense is that values are internal to a society or a culture. And there is an author that uh, Bobbio, for example, is also relativist but is a strong defender of democracy. And Kelsen is a strong defender of democracy but is a relativist. And there is an author that says that Bobbio is a believing relativist. This means a strong democrat, but relativist. And this is a paradox. And I think uh, that this positive law cosmopolitanism that defends Jorge in this, in, in this book and in his approach to, to international relations, the requirements of universal law are so strong uh, in the moral uh, domain that you need more than relativism, more than non-cognositivism. You cannot be relativist in the weak sense. Uh, for example, Rawls talks about the principles of justice. Um, and, well, one, one doubt is why you says that the positive law cosmopolitanism includes the Kant view, but Kant is used naturalist, or Kant was a defender of natural law. Mm -hmm. You make a special interpretation of Kant. I, I interpreted that you, mm -hmm. you made a special interpretation of uh, Kant. Uh, for example, in the, in the universal law, um, when you says that uh, the basic rights are included in universal law, and these basic rights includes um, um, uh, all the states should uh, have an agreement about what is the basic rights in order to, uh, to, to achieve this uh, basic uh, universal law. Okay, in order to have a consensus, an overlapping consensus in terms of roles, you need some moral uh, consensus, previous moral consensus, because uh, if you have weak relativism, intercultural dialogue is irrelevant. If you are a moral skeptic, if you are a no cognitivism, it's impossible the dialogue, it's impossible the agreement. And I think a minimal, a minimal that what is the right, what is the, the right to, to food, what is the right to shelter, uh, some minimal consensus you need in order to uh, an agreement of basic of basic uh, rights. Uh, another problem will be if uh, what you said it must avoid domination or hegemonic power of any kind. Universal law should avoid universal uh, hegemonic power of any kind. If I understand well, this is the universal law not the national law. Mm -hmm. is the universal law should be uh, always anti-hegemonic. Mm -hmm. But the, this is morally thick. This means this cannot be stung from um, um, moral skepticism, from non-cognitivism. You, you, uh, you need morality. You need a, a strong, mor a strong or, a, or a some thick moral position, I think. Uh, um, <coughs> finally, the exclusive positivism. Uh, okay, well, this is interesting. This is a, a, a great debate. All, all the time we are discussing exclusive positivism, inclusive positivism. My point is that you mentioned that moral is not a necessary condition for a legal system to exist, but not theoretically. Okay, yeah. But not theoretically. But in, in, the, in the real world and in the international law, international relations, 
And uh, well, this uh, means is uh, near to the source, social sources uh, thesis of legal methodological positivism. And uh, this is a strong point. And uh, I make two criticisms. First, the circumstances of justice, that is very well known, the minimal content of, um, of natural law in heart, in rules. Uh, uh, there is an expression that law is not a club of suicidals. Uh, there is an expression of heart, no? And uh, you should not kill. This is in every, in every law. Uh, how do you solve this, this point? Um, this, uh, the, the morality is not a necessary condition of, of law. And the second point is the internal point of view of heart. Uh, when I explain this to my students, I say uh, <coughs> a system, a legal system cannot be stable only from the external point of view. You need acceptance. You need participants. You need people who believe that what you are doing is just especially in the Supreme Court and in the military. But, uh, and then there is the real rule of the condition, but especially you need that, uh, if you want that the system, and maybe this is not critical immorality from one side, but this is social morality. And okay, um, but I think it is an extraordinary, extraordinary book. I had um, one of my professors that I learned a lot from him, he says that uh, he liked only the books that make uh, him think about and even disagree. When you do disagree with someone is uh, that you learn from these books and I like very much to, to have read your book and to <laughs> learn from your book. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Gracias.